Here we go. I think I just found it. You should all be able, able to start video now. Yep. We're good. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay. So we're getting a little late start. Um, we have about we have about 23 attendees in the webinar section and uh, nine panelists. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight here for the first uh, Hamilton Human Rights Forum. Um, we're gonna we got a little bit of a, a presentation for everybody tonight. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing our chairman of the board of selectmen, Sean Farrell. The board was the one that uh, adopted this policy and, and started the uh, commission. And uh, Joe Borsolino is our moderator this evening. Joe is a civil rights attorney for the last 30 years here in Boston. He's also the co-founder and current chairman of the Dead and Human Rights Commission. And he has a wealth of experience in kind of helping to manage these kind of community conversations. So we're very, very excited and happy to have him here tonight. And uh, with that, I will turn off my video and throw to Sean. Right. Can I, so I don't have an introductory thing. Um, we do have one of our panelists who is just having trouble getting on, but I, so I'm working with her. Uh, okay. <laughs> keep it, keep us up to date. All right. All right. Uh, so as, as Joe mentioned, I'm the chair of the board of selectmen and, and you know, just like to say hello and, and welcome everyone to the forum tonight. Uh, you know, I just want to thank everybody for attending uh, and taking the time out of your day to listen to our program tonight. And Joe, uh, can you mute? This journey started, um, over the summertime, I guess, um, with myself and uh, Joe and our chief of police, Russ Stevens, uh, through conversations with Anna Siedzik uh, about kind of current events and what we could do to, to kind of make, it, make a difference, I guess. Uh, and through those conversations, um, we started to kind of work down this path that brought us to where we are tonight. Uh, and a, a lot of that was through Anna and the Human Rights Coalition that was formed with Hamilton and Wenham. Uh, and Wenham has uh, adopted a Human Rights uh, Committee as well. Um, so we'll have a committee in each town and then kind of an overarching umbrella group um, to kind of all work together for a, a positive force in, in both towns. Um, it was a... Um, well-supported uh, universal vote by the Board of Selectmen to um, bring the HRC together. Um, and we thought it important uh, to promote human rights in our community. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, seating the council or the, the committee uh, and, and seeing some, some positive influence in, in, in what it brings to our community. Um, and then I'll, I'll kick it off to uh, Joe Borsellino and, and, and we'll start the to meet. So, so uh, Sean, just point out, or do, is this since it's a selectman meeting officially? Do we need to call it to order? How's that work? No, I don't. I don't yes. think we do because right. it's just a forum. Uh, we did post for it because we do have a quorum. We're not really making any decisions tonight. We're just just having the forum. So excellent. Thank you. I spelled Carol's name wrong. Will Russell be speaking tonight? As Go as earlier. Uh, Russell is going to be one of the two town speakers. Are you going to speak, Russell? I'm more than happy to speak. You might not be able to turn me off. I had you, Mary Beth, and Sean on, and uh, I know Mary Beth can't attend, but yeah, go ahead and say a few words, Russ. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, those who were intended. I appreciate everyone coming. Um, you know, this, this is a, this started, like Sean said, by by Anna and the board and Joe and a couple of us got together and we said, you know, we, we saw a need for something like this. And to me, it's about how to get our community feel for all of us to feel included. It's about giving the people a voice to make sure everyone's treated fairly. Um, make sure we convey trustworthy motives, especially from the policing, from the policing point of view, I want the people in town to be able to trust their police department and feel like they can trust their police department. I would like to have more people come into the PD. Let me open up the police department. Let me show you what it's all about. Do ride alongs with people in town. So I, I really want people to, to know that they're part of the town and their voices can be heard. Okay, thank you, Russ. Okay, so I'll introduce myself to you because I'm the one outsider in this group by design. I have no knowledge of anybody other than who I've met in the course of volunteering to do this. And I must say that it's been a wonderful introduction to your town. Uh, you, I can see the goodwill and 
a decency that, that you all have. And I'm very happy for, for what you're doing. I'll give you a little bit of a detail to, so you get an idea of who the person is that's going to be talking with you all. Amanda, night. if you can uh, mute, please, there's no feedback to your. You're getting feedback? Yeah, it's all set now. Thanks. Okay, so we probably should have everyone turn off their, put their mute buttons on, then when we speak one at a time. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Okay, so in, in a nutshell, I have been a civil rights attorney for my most of my career. I was born in Chicago and transplanted to New England 36 years ago. And I've always been committed to the human rights causes. I grew up in a uh, ghetto in projects in Chicago, transferred here to Chicago, uh, to Boston, went to law school. And on my graduation of law school, I immediately started to volunteer at the NAACP in Boston. And I worked there as a young associate for a number of years. And I became the head of the NAACP legal operation in Boston and Boston metropolitan area. Uh, Deval Patrick was in charge of the state of Massachusetts and its connection with the Legal Defense Fund in New York. I was in charge of Boston and the metro area. And we handled about 500 cases a year and they covered everything from gender, age, handicap, police misconduct, employment discrimination, housing, et cetera. Um, and it was a wonderful, it's the best experience of my entire legal career. Uh, I formed friendships with leaders in the political and social communities of Boston that have lasted my entire life and career. And those people have uh, stuck together and helped me when I formed the Human Rights Commission and with a group here, here in Dedham. And I would be happy to uh, assist your town as you develop in connecting you with those who are leaders, uh, whether it be the ACLU, whether it be the NAACP, whether it be the uh, law schools, uh, Suffolk, Northeastern. Uh, I have probably mentored about 30 or more students in all of those universities, whether it be Harvard, Suffolk, Northeastern Law School. I've stayed with it my entire career. And I've headed uh, pro bono clinics throughout Roxbury and Dorchester area for a number of years and uh, came here to Dedham, settled with my wife. I, I have an interracial family. Uh, so did I in Illinois. And I have two children. One is a graduate student at the New England Conservatory of Music. He's a jazz musician and composer. My daughter's a high school student. Uh, we in Dedham have gone through a similar uh, emergence that you are going through in Hamilton. In Dedham, we have 25,000 people. You have about 8,000. In order for us to have a human rights commission, we had to meet with the entire public and that public meetings had to lead to 273 people agreeing to have a commission, which resulted in probably three months of debate. The vote was very close. So uh, your town is probably very much like Dedham and all the other towns in the metro area. Those of you who know the history of the suburbs in the metro area, you know that the suburbs were formed with, with the deliberate design of racial segregation in cooperation with the FHA and the Realtors Association. They were designed specifically to keep them homogenous. The uh, GI Bill contributed, the New Deal contributed, and people of color were de denied access until late into the 1970s. So it's not an accident that your town is 90% or more Caucasian. Dedham was itself until about 10 years ago. And so isn't Westwood and, and uh, Easton and Wellesley and all the other towns nearby. So we're all dealing with all of these issues together. I can see that you're relatively a wealthy town in comparison with national averages. I've done some demographic studies of your town to prepare myself tonight. And that tells me that you're probably gonna have some issues with aging and the fair treatment of older adults who wanna stay and live in your town. So I'm sure all these topics are gonna to come up uh, for you all uh, in the, during the evening. We're gonna have some guest speakers that are your fellow citizens. 
and they are going to stimulate uh, thoughts and ideas. And then the public are going to be invited to first ask some questions to the residential speakers and use the Q&A at any time that you come up with a great idea or a thought that you would like to, to see addressed tonight, please type in your Q&A and your town manager will read them and collect them and get to as many as we can. And then after we speak with the uh, re citizens and they speak on their particular areas of concern, then you can address questions to your leaders your select board, your town manager, and have them give you some more definite ideas. Um, let me give you just a little bit of a look into what you can look forward to. Um, and, and I hope you're excited about this. We have only existed for three years in Dedham. And already in those three years, we have a human rights television program that airs monthly and people in Dedham meet one another through the audiovisual world and get to know who their neighbors are on a very personal level. And our guests have been Vietnamese, Filipino, African American from South Africa, from Wales, same sex marriage partners, children. We have had everybody on the show. Sometimes it's topical and you will deal with the issues that are most important to your particular community. And, and it's handled in a, in a constructive way that you start to like one another and you start to get used to working with each other to solve problems. And that's really what tonight is all about. So when people speak tonight, the ground rules are basically be open-minded, be open-hearted, speak in earnest and with good faith and you will develop friendships and intimacies that you may not have had before tonight started. Avoid making any statements about any particular person. Uh, if you've had an experience with an institution or, or a, a, a store or something that you'd like to talk about, just say store or institution if you can avoid it. Because the idea here tonight is to communicate ideas. When you get into your commission and you start to handle things uh, in operation, you have plenty of time for all of that. What you really want to do is establish a network of communication so that you can comfortably know that you always have a place to handle whatever problem and no problem is too big for your town. And at the end of the day, you are one family and you're one town and you all have each other's backs and you recognize that nobody is more important or better than anyone else and that every one of you matter and that your opinions matter and they're all worthy of respect. So with that said, uh, let me uh, introduce the first speaker that I have uh, scheduled to speak, which is um, known to you as Mandy. And I would like to turn it over to Mandy and have her speak and address the, the community. Sorry about that, I had to unmute. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this. I've lived in Hamilton pretty much my entire life. Um, my dad, lived, my dad lived here his whole life and I, we built, my husband and I built our house here. So we've, we've been here for a while and we've made some lifelong friends and um, enjoyed a lot of our stay here. We have had a few bumps in the road, um, like most people. And I think what um, uh, I am, I'm pretty busy and scattered and I travel a lot with my kids or at an age when I'm running around, but I thought this would be something pretty special to be a part of because um, of my past experience, my kids past experience. Um, I had some issues when my son was younger um, as far as him being black in a predominantly white town and just um, sort of how to handle those situations. Um, situations that weren't necessarily a police matter but I did need some support with it. Um, he was bullied at one point called racial names at school and there wasn't being much done about it. And I remember after leaving the school feeling like, where do I go now? Um, nothing was done about this. And we kind of just had to 
sort of sit on it and it left such a feeling of anger and um, resentment. And that's not, you know, a way that I wanted to live at that time and certainly don't now. You know, we've also had some situations um, where I was, I received a message on Facebook from someone I didn't know about being new, you know, moving to town and being new and she was a white woman, her children were black, her husband was black and her son who was 12 went into a local store and um, he went with his friends one time and everything was fine, you know, went in, got what, he, got what they needed and left. And then he went back a week later to get some school supplies and mom waited in the car and she ended up having to go inside because he was followed around the store and asked what he was doing um, in the store. And she said, you know, I didn't want to think that it was racial, but it, it, it was. And she didn't really have anywhere to go with that. Um, so that's what sort of motivated me to say, you know, it happened to me when I was growing up. Um, there were some instances that that happened years ago. I, I know at one point I was pregnant with my first child and I was pulled over in broad daylight. Um, when I asked why I was pulled over, the police officer told me that there were some robberies in town when you know people were um, stealing TVs off, on the street. And here I was, you know, eight months pregnant in broad daylight, being sort of accused of that. So that was another incident where my father and I had to, you know, go down to the police station and resolve it. And, and we've come so far in so many ways, but there's still certain situations that are coming up and happening. And I really feel like having a, a resource um, in town like this commission that can come together and, and support individuals and families that do encounter having problems of all types, whether it be, you know, the elderly or, you know, if it's a race issue or, um, anything else, gay and lesbian. I, I think, I just think it's great to be able to have somewhere to go um, before it escalates. And I also think it's a good opportunity for just there to be dialogue, you know, and, and education on differences and equality and what that really means. So I'm looking forward to where I think um, this can all go. Okay, hey, thank you so much, Mandy. And we, we will go to the next speaker, but after the three speakers have spoken, then we'll open it up to questions. So the next speaker on tonight's schedule is Carol Mazetta. Carol, are you there? Carol needs some direction. Well, Carol, okay, remember, tap at the bottom and where <laughs> you guess. see the... Yeah. Where you see the video, tap that. Um, there'll be a red line through it. So you just tap that. And okay. then you're... Do you see it? Wait a minute. Yeah, she's live now. She's live. <laughs> Come over there again. Don't make fun of me. I'm elderly. <laughs> All we need your beautiful smile and we've got it. Oh, my gosh. Uh, oh, did, you, did you... Okay, tap lightly on the bottom. Oh my gosh. That um, nothing is happening here. Okay. okay. Do you uh, maybe maybe Steve could go next and I'll run over right. to Carol's house. No, 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 no. Don't don't go running over. No. What well, uh, people want that, to see you? Stat video, is that it? Stat video? Yes. No. Uh, oh, I don't okay. Know. Hold on. It came, came up a minute ago. <laughs> hey, Joe had a problem too. <laughs> Quiet. You people were taught how to use a spoon by us. So, 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 so Carol, so Carol keep, it should be keep right working on it, Carol, and we'll we'll I'm go right. to Steve and Rosie. Right. You could call her too if you want at her home. He's and, got my phone. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you should have went to her house. Right okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go to the next one. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> In, introduce yourself and 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 please speak. Hi, thanks uh, to everybody that's here. Thanks for the human to the Human Rights Commission. My name is Steve Harrington, and I am the executive director of the North Shore. Hi, Carol. Do you want to? Now that we've got her, do we want to go <laughs> for her before it goes away? Now that you've got me, don't let me go. <laughs> okay. Go for okay, that's fine. Then go ahead, Carol. Oh, all right. Thank you very much. Um, one of the questions uh, was asked of me is, do you feel invisible um, as, well, as an elderly person? Um, not really invisible, but I think our government, we need elderly housing badly here in, in Hamilton. Um, 
it seems like nobody wants it in their backyard. Uh, I don't know why. We're very quiet neighbors. Most of us go to bed at six o'clock for crying out loud. So we don't bother anybody. Um, it's, it's very hard to get the housing authority in Boston to um, repair the buildings here, to give the money to the directors. Um, uh, the only time it seems like the government wants to talk to us is when they need our vote. Other than that, they just don't seem to care that much about us elderly people. Uh, we have to be, we're, we try to be our own advocates. Now, Hamilton is one of the few towns that doesn't have our own van. Wenham, Wenham has one, uh, Ipswich has one, but for some reason, we can't get a van for our seniors. So that's, you know, that's a problem when they need to um, just go shopping or something. They have to call uh, CATA and they're not always reliable, unfortunately. Um, but that, you know, other than that, the police department can't be better. And the fire department here in Hamilton, we are so fortunate to have these fellows they take very good care of us. And they, my husband and I took the uh, Citizens uh, um, Academy at the police department. We went on the ride along and we, we toured the Middleton uh, prison. And it was very enlightening because we could see what the police do every day. And it's not an easy job. But uh, other than that, I, I, you know, I do, I feel respected because I demand the respect. I don't, uh, I just don't, you know, the old saying, you teach people how to treat you. And if you let them mistreat you, then shame on you. But not everybody knows how to speak up, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, that, that's about all I have to say. I don't know if you have any questions for me at all. Um, Rose, uh, Carol, can I ask you, yes. being an outsider uh, and having uh -huh. gone through this in Dedham, what about uh -huh. the accessibility and use of public parks and sidewalks and so forth? Do you, yeah, and, we're, and the tax we're, base, how do you feel that's a f impact? We're very, we're very fortunate where our housing is situated. Uh, it's a hop, skip and a jump. Well, it's pretty slow hop, skip and a jump for us. But the downtown is very close. The Hamilton Library is right around the corner. Um, so we're very accessible here. I think this is one of the problems getting elderly housing. There's no land anywhere close enough to downtown. Is that what you have in mind? Hello? Yeah, just in general. And, and okay. also in public parks, it is a lot oh, of times yes. the, the complaint is that it's all for the kids, it's all for sports, and where's the mm -hmm. quality of life for for older adults? And I'm not well, sure how that feels I, in your town. I don't know what they want. I mean, if they want to go down there and play basketball, the basketball, you know, what do they want? Uh, the elderly, they have benches down there. You can bring your lunch down there. Um, it they've got the pond that. I ice skated on as a kid. Um, I don't know what the elderly complain about. It's a beautiful park. Oh, that, that we worked very hard to get built down there. They can sit in the gazebo and have a picnic lunch. So I, I really, I don't know what. Rosie, your hair looks nice, by the way. <laughs> so I don't know what they mean by the park. I, I really don't. It's very easy to get to the park from here. Okay, thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Okay, so Steve. Okay, I'm back on. Um, my name is Steve Harrington. I'm the executive director of NAGLI, which is the North Shore Alliance of LGBTQ Youth. We are located in Salem. Um, I 
uh, am very honored to be a part of this presentation. I am not a resident of Hamilton, um, uh, but I'm very familiar with Hamilton and Wenham. My husband was the town manager in Wenham for 10 years, actually, and so I've spent a fair amount of time up there. Um, one of the aspects of the LGBTQ community that is a little bit different from the other two speakers that we have tonight is that we are indeed invisible for the most part. Um, you cannot tell by looking at somebody usually whether they're part of the LGBTQ community. And that fosters a little bit of a different scenario in that um, there's unknown uh, discrimination and prejudice even within households for youth who are not uh, or anybody who is not um, feeling comfortable um, coming out. One of the things I wanted to start off with really, really quickly, um, Joe is sharing the screen. We all know that there's a whole slew of words out there right now that, that we don't know what they mean. And my thought was, if we know what we're talking about right away, then it makes it a little bit easier to know when we are misspeaking or denigrating somebody unintentionally. So there's this thing called a genderbred person. And what this shows is every human being on the planet has four characteristics. Everybody doesn't matter about their gender or orientation or anything. And these four are your expression, which is your gender expression. And that is how you dress yourself, how you comb your hair, whether you wear makeup, perhaps your mannerisms, your gender expression. The second is your gender. And your gender is contained only in your brain. That's the only place where your gender is located. That's the gender that you are. Now, this may or may not correspond to the gender you were assigned at birth, but your hand doesn't feel male or female, your toe doesn't feel male or female. It is your brain that determines your gender. The third aspect is your orientation, normally referred to uh, or, or related to your heart. And this is who you have a romantic or a sexual attraction towards. Um, and then the last character is the physical anatomy you were born with. So if you stop and think about yourself and how these four characteristics pertain to you, you can understand these four things. Here is the most important aspect of all of this. These four things are unrelated to each other. They're four separate characteristics. And what this means is if I were transgender, I might be straight or gay or bisexual. I could choose to have um, surgery or not, and I could dress in a different gender than what I really, really feel I am. So once you get, you can, and you can go online and, and look at this. You can stop sharing now, Joe, that's fine. Um, but knowing those four characteristics and knowing that those are unrelated to each other is the best way for people to understand how tacit prejudice, tacit discrimination can happen within the queer community. So that um, you may be standing right next to somebody. It might be your sister or brother. It might be your cousin. It could be in school. And you can say things that are really, really hurtful, that are really discriminatory. We all know we've heard our youth say things, oh, that's so gay and they mean it in a really derogatory way. Um, language right now is really important for people who, uh, for whose gender, for whom their gender is not um, traditional, shall we say, whether they're transgender, non-binary, which means they identify not 100% male or 100% female. There's a whole plethora of vocabulary out there that is really important to understand when we're talking about prejudice or discrimination or bullying. And what needs to happen in order for this to change is we need a culture change. We need for this to be normalized, that somebody whose gender is not what they were assigned at birth or who falls in love with somebody who, who you may consider non-traditional, that those people are accepted for exactly who they are. And it, it's, they are the only ones that can identify themselves. And really all they want to do is live their life, be loved, love in return, 
and be a good person. That's really the bottom line. And whether they're gay or straight or non-binary or transgender, none of that really matters. Are they a good person? But again, the thing that makes this community a little bit different is that you can't, you can't see this necessarily. You might find somebody that you, that you think is flamboyant and make assumptions about them, but there are many, many, many people um, for whom you can't tell that. There are pro athletes, there are neighbors, there are people that work in stores. And if you're standing in a store and you say something about a faggot or that's so gay, you know, you don't know how that hurts people, particularly if they're young and if they're in the closet. So I implore you to print off that gender bread person and just keep it somewhere handy and remind yourself that those four characteristics are very different. And it may take a while for you to comprehend that, but it's really, really important. And thank you. And, and you know, I'm more than happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Steve. And I, I would like to say too, as we were planning this event, uh, I was speaking with a number of the leaders in this town and we started to talk about LGBTQ issues and almost nobody had not a empathic experience of their own, whether it was a family member or a close friend and everybody started to talk and find the connections and the similarities. And I guess my curiosity, Steve, you sound very passionate and thoughtful on this. Do you feel like it's a safe place in the town in general? Or do you feel like it is more of, it's okay, but don't talk about it and don't be public and just keep it to yourself? You know, there, there's an irony there because when Jeff uh, was town manager of, of um, Wenham, it was one of the original things he said in his interview and we never had an issue there. And yet I know of people who live in Hamilton Wenham um, for whom um, gay rights are an issue. Um, you know, when I was growing up back in the Neanderthal days, um, I was hemorrhaging inside as a gay man, but I wasn't a target. It's sort of reversed now so that people can feel more themselves, but as they do that, they become a target. Um, and so there's a, there's a give and take there. I think that Hamilton Wenham um, is largely great. And in this case, having a human rights commission is way ahead of the curve for many, many towns. And so kudos for even broaching um, this topic. Thank you, thank you so much. So um, I'm, we're gonna open it up to questions now and, 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 and and uh, Joe will handle it through the Q&A. But somebody asked earlier, um, when they dialogue with the three panelists, can they share their own personal experiences in a conversation? And I think that's fine. That's an essence of, of intimacy. Please do. You know, just be mindful of time. Uh, try to keep it to three to four minutes if you can, so that there's enough time for everybody to speak. And, uh, and get to know one another. And as we just got to know Steve very much, uh, I know for myself, I've just met him other than a few minutes the, uh, before this, and I like him. I wanna know him now and I wanna talk to him more. And I would think that that's probably a, a general consensus. Oh, now well. I'm curious. So that's that's the whole idea here. Yeah, I'll talk to you. So, um, I, you know, we had a, a, rep, a, re, a resident, Frank has asked if he could speak and, uh, and share some of his experience. So Frank, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, this is Frank in Dallas. Hello. And, uh, hi, uh, first of all, I really want to thank um, the, uh, the event organizer for this opportunity because I can see that folks join here because there are feelings of hurt or their family or friends have experienced something that they really don't want to experience ever again or um, other people to feel that way. And, um, and this already is a great opportunity for people to talk about those feelings. And it's always a great first step to healing. And um, speak, speaking of our own experience as an Asian family here in Hamilton, we, we still remember the first day we visited the town and uh, thinking about different places we can move to. And we just 
mesmerized by the beautiful sceneries and the wonderful school systems and really uh, had a great dream about, you know, what our life could be. Um, and we've been trying for many years to uh, break into the social circle, but um, I'm afraid to say that after 10 years, uh, it's still very difficult. We've never been asked for any play dates, and our our and, son uh, has been uh, my son's best friend. Um, uh, they also share same same sport, and we have cared this his friend as if our own children. Every time my son wants to hang out with him, and we would take him along to visit nice restaurants, Brazilian restaurant, Japanese restaurant, and just about a couple months ago, I saw my son's iPad. And this best so-called best friend will randomly say, "Thank you, Chink," and and you know, you know, I, there's a little story. I, I'll I'll try to make it quick. Um, starting from last March, at the beginning of the pandemic, I'm very thankful that my 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 son wants to. He's an environmentalist. He wants to clean up this environment. So every day, we start walking. Uh, about six, seven, eight miles, um, picking up trash along towns. And there were days that we were encounter the situation where we, we would go to people's yard and pick up the trash and someone would say, what do you think you're doing, right? And then a lot of times I have to reframe myself and say, oh yeah, I truly apologize. And um, yeah, I definitely should ask for your permission. Would you like to have it back? And Often time I would hear something like, what's in there? And then there, there, there will be all these trash that I pick up along the road and he'll say, no, you can keep that to yourself. Or there will be people saying, uh, why don't you, why are you wearing that mask? You're free, breathing some free air in this country. And, and I was on, on the good days, I would try to say, uh, hey, you know what? Something I found very grateful for this pandemic is wearing a mask. And he said, why? I said, well, you know, it's because uh, normally I have severe allergy and because of wearing a mask, I don't have an allergy anymore. After all, you wouldn't want me to have sneezing, a runny nose and sneezing in front of you thinking that I have the virus, right? So, so along 200 days that we, uh, every day we pick up trash, we learn that to deal with things in a way that there is an actual environment, right? And then there is the, forgiveness, the kindness. And I think oftentimes we are all intrinsically the same. However, the comfort of the environment causes us to have the ignorance and act in a certain way. So Joseph, when you share with me that story, how you came from Chicago, I truly inspired us. And you further went on and tried to help other community. And we're really thankful for you to lend your knowledge to help other town. And so we can grow this community into a loving community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Frank. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so it, it, would, any, would, uh, would others like to then ask some questions to the panelists? Joe, do you have questions? Yeah, we got a Q and A section going here as people are putting them into the Q and A instead. So uh, for Steve, um, a, a, a resident asked, uh, she appreciates that you said we're doing pretty well in Hamilton and Wenham, but can you speak more about the depression and suicidality among LGBTQ youth in our town and every town? Sure, uh, and that's a really valid question. I don't know if people learn today that Alabama has made it. <laughs> that's me. Uh, uh, Alabama has has is on the brink of passing a law that makes it a felony to help any transgender youth under the age of 19 and you can spend it as much as five years or $120,000. Um, it's things like that, even though we're in Massachusetts, all we have to do is, is have a 12 year old transgender youth um, read that and feel like he's worthless. Um, Statistics have shown that in Massachusetts, our rates of suicide, our rates of depression, our rates of homelessness, even though we're in the forefront of all this progressive um, action, match the, the um, countrywide. 48% of LGBTQ considered suicide in Massachusetts, 
last year, um, depression, um, anxiety, homelessness, 25% of high school queer youth in, Ma in Massachusetts have been homeless at some point. Um, so our figures uh, mirror those of the rest of the country and it's a, a real shock and surprise um, to hear about Massachusetts uh, that our statistics are just as bad as everywhere else. So I, I appreciate that. Um, we have tons of hotlines. Uh, NAGLI has our own rapid response team. Um, if you know anybody who needs help right away, we also have COVID-19 um, funding right now. If you know um, a youth who is suffering financially, um, please let us know. We do have those um, funds available through Essex County Community Foundation. Just, I don't know. Hey, that that's right? great. Um, thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, I'll move on to the next question so we can keep people moving. Um, hey, Joe, for Joe, 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 some people on the panel want to comment too, uh, so oh, just don't okay. on us. I'm, right. I'm sorry. Um, it's Rosie. Could I just make a follow up um, question to to Steve? So, Steve, I and I and maybe I'm wrong, but but the way I understood that law in um, Alabama um, is that. Um, uh, young people who are under the age of 18 cannot well it's it's predicated that they should not be able to go under um, sex change operations without parental consent until they're 18 do I do I understand that incorrectly no it's it's any care if any care is given okay. to any any youth any yeah. gender um, related care a youth uh, under 19. So it, it relates to anything. It's not just. That. Okay. So um, thank you for, for clarifying that for me. Okay. Uh, so maybe anyone else on the panel like to respond or ask a question before uh, I move on? I, did, I just have a, a quick thing. Just to, to Frank's comment, <clears throat> family earlier. Uh, as soon as he said about the trash picking up, I, I knew exactly. No, he is. Even though we've never met Frank, I just want to say thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Sean. I think people should also know that the community has recognized him as one of the hometown heroes this year. That's uh, right. he, and, he and his family, so that, that's great. Uh, that's right. Unfortunately, there's negative Hello. everywhere, but I'm very happy to see the you know community organizations do recognize the good work of folks like Frank. Um, I think we'll uh, get to the next one. Uh, for Joe Borsolino from uh, a resident, uh, what are some of the issues that Dedham HRC has addressed? So when you get up and running, you are going to address all the issues and those you're talking about tonight and those that you didn't think about until tomorrow. We have addressed just about every issue that I can think of. In these three years, we have had a mental health program that spanned three to four months. It was a 12 night program and we dealt with suicide and depression we had five mental health professionals from regional health facilities and clinics and hospitals. We had a book read on mental health to, for everybody in the town to participate in. We had music and art programs for the kids. We involved the children's room from Arlington, which is a home for families that are survivors of suicides and death of children. Um, that, that was a centerpiece to a large part of our year. We have had to deal as your town will and every town deals with racial issues, issues that Frank has brought up and Mandy has brought up. Um, my son is African-American because my wife is African-American. Uh, in America, as you know, if you're brown at all, you're black, you're not mixed, you're, you're black. So my son during the uh, Ferguson, Missouri killing and subsequent killings of young black males started to get high anxiety, started to pull his hair out of his head and take chunks in his hand. And he being a very deep thinker and unknown to me, wrote a letter to our police chief and walked the letter over to the department and asked if he could please meet with the police officers to help settle him and make him feel safe in his town and the letter was not responded to and he wasn't responded to. And when I found out, 
I started to call the police department myself. And I was put on hold and, and paused. And, and I wasn't even, I even set, went to the ascent of saying, I'm right across the street. You can see me in the window. I'm waving right now. We're neighbors. Well, you can handle that one of two ways. You can take that as an insult and you can dig your heels in and say, I'm never going to trust this town or this department. Or you can take it as an opportunity to get to know somebody, which I did. Uh, and I'm happy to say that the Human Rights Commission and myself are hand in glove with the police chief in Dedham. We've become best friends and we have worked together to revise the town's uh, de-escalation policies. After the George Floyd murder, we sat down and we got the policies from across the United States and the city of Boston and we, we revised them. And he voluntarily revised and did his own work and he also does the accreditation work that 75% of the departments don't do in Massachusetts that they're supposed to do. So he keeps records. He keeps track of uh, anything that has to do with profiling or hate crimes. He keeps the documentation that's required. He offers citizens academies that gives instructions to the town of Dedham and its members. We have connected uh, and his name is Michael Dontremont, and I hope that, Russell, you get to meet him at some point. Uh, I'd be happy to, again, uh, let you overlap. It's not only your town that I'm working with, but I've worked with Hingham, Duxbury, many other towns, the Chief Police Chief of Westwood, because it's a regional thing, and it's something that we can all do for one another. But uh, our chief now meets with families of color, whether it's going to their home or whether it's inviting them to the department and they talk very intimately about fear and about uh, profiling and, and, and insecurity in the town. Uh, we have developed a, a, what's called an anti-racial coalition in Dedham. We went from being a 98% town Caucasian to one that has now almost a 15% student population of color. So the anti-racial coalition grew to a thousand members before the end of this year. And the chief now meets with the anti-racial coalition on a regular basis. It's a wonderful, wonderful collaboration and it's all the difference. And I am confident that your chief will do the same. And I think it's important to say that one of the things that we've worked on is to listen and to not be defensive and at the same time, don't be overly aggressive because when you're not defensive, you're gonna listen and you're gonna inspire trust. People of color know, they know that in Massachusetts, for instance, we incarcerate black residents nine times more than whites. That's three times percent more than the, the rest of the country. They know that the stops and frisks and detentions are astronomically higher. They know about how they're treated in stores and perceived. So if you deny and you get defensive, you're not gonna inspire the trust. At the same time, if you brush and paint everybody with the same brush and attack because you're so afraid that you're gonna be hurt and disappointed, you're not gonna meet Russell and you're not gonna find the best of him. So these are, this, this is another thing that we have done in Dedham. We have worked with our library. Our library is a resource that reaches out to the whole town, including the school children and the families and the adults. They have provided resource guides to everyone in our town for issues of mental health, for LGBTQ resources, for housing, for domestic abuse, for uh, sex trafficking, uh, everything that you can think of. And it's an ongoing relationship. The Historical Society has formed an alliance with, the, with our Human Rights Commission. I'm not sure if you have one, but the Historical Society amended its platform and its platform is now to tell the stories of those whose stories have gone untold. They have, and with my assistance in the Nobles and Greeno School, have approved a student senior project and opened up the archives and microfiche of the newspapers dating back to the 1700s, found the slave records of the wealthy family owners that founded the town and whose streets and buildings are named after, 
and we have looked up restrictive covenants and deeds. We work together all the time and we do webinars and programs on a, on a pretty much daily basis. Um, LGBTQ, we'll be working on doing a flag raising for Pride Day in June. And we're also working on a Juneteenth celebration with families of color this June to recognize it. And one of the accomplishments I'm most proud of, and I have shared it with some of your select board members, we do one of the best Martin Luther King celebrations in the area outside of Boston. We attracted 500 people to the first event and we have our speakers have been the first African-American commissioner of discrimination, who is a very personal friend of mine and worked with me at the NAACP 30 years ago. Uh, we have had uh, Rasan Hall, who's the son of David Hall, the first African-American dean of the uh, Northeastern School of Law and is now the head of the Racial Justice Project for the American Civil Liberties Union. All of those members have come into our town and become part of our town. We also have, because of history, we have no black teachers or Hispanic teachers or Asian teachers uh, that teach history, sociology or anything of the sort. So to fill that need, I, we work with the Youth Commission and have student groups called Real Talk and others. And we will be doing an educational program where experts in these fields are going to teach these children and offer classes to them. And those are gonna be happening throughout this spring. Uh, so I could go on for quite some time, um, but those are the things that are happening and they weren't happening before. And now they're happening at a rate that I, you don't even know how to slow them down once they get going. So what you guys will probably end up doing is, you know, you'll probably set up subcommittees and you'll start working with Steve and Carol and Mandy on, on issues that are most of concern and start forming friendships and relationships and tackling these problems. Um, so I hope that answers the question, but I think I've said enough. Joe, I wanted to um, just follow up to your to your statements about reaching out to people. I had um, quite an experience. I do some um, legal work on medical legal work for the public defender's office, and there was been doing that for for several years. And there was um, a particularly disturbing crime that I was involved in, and. Um, I didn't know until halfway through my work for 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 this um, case that it was um, an African American man, and um, the only time I actually met him was in court, and I testified on behalf of the defense, and um, this is just it's just such. A, uh, about a month later, he went to jail and probably will spend the rest of his life in jail. But I got this letter from wherever the prison was and he and he wrote me this letter and he he said um thank you for speaking up for me nobody has ever done that for me in my whole life Ugh. and i just thought oh my god if only we had the opportunity to reach out to people who feel isolated and alienated if only somebody had reached out to him 20 years ago and I will never ever forget that and it it's just made such a profound life in the way I look at this business that I'm involved in. Thanks Rosie for sharing that. It, it, this is what it's all about. You guys are a great town. I'm really excited for you. Uh, any, any other questions Joe or Q&A's? No, uh, but there, there was a statement from uh, one one uh, resident. But I asked her if she wanted to make the statement, but she hasn't responded. Um, so I, I could read that. Um, she said it's more more comment than a question. Um, Reference that one of the speakers talked about demanding uh, to be treated with respect, and while she understands that, she said that uh, she has black children, and on a few occasions they've been treated poorly by the public schools or by the local police. Uh, like Mandy, she didn't feel that those that they have the right to or have anywhere to go to complain about this effectively and uh, do not believe that it is a person of color in town's job to, quote unquote, demand that they be treated better it is the town's responsibility to call for non-discriminatory treatment um, and, and basically, you know, make sure that people feel safe. Uh, I'm, I'm summarizing there. I'm not, not giving the whole quote, but 
Uh, she did ask if Mandy wanted to comment further, and and I just say that 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 is exactly the reason that um, Sean um, and and I and the police chief talked about this starting last summer, and we, we the, Sean brought it to the board of selectmen. We we agree. We think that there should be a place for people to go, um, and that's what the purpose of the commission is. So. Um, does anybody want to? Steve's raising his hand. Yeah, there was a there was also a comment um, from somebody who who asked all the panelists, "What are your thoughts if someone supports human rights related to their own interests but seems to publicly negate other groups' human rights?" And um, uh, they continued, "Is it possible to support human rights selectively, or does being a supporter of human rights mean embracing all?" And that's a really loaded question, I guess. We all come from our own experience and in our own experience, we develop our own prejudices and there's not a, a person alive, I think that doesn't have some prejudice. But once we become adults, we have a responsibility to open up our minds and open up our hearts and try to understand um, other people as equal human beings. So for me, it boggles the mind to think that I will pick and choose who I respect and who I honor. Um, but, you know, we, in, in some ways, every one of us does that. It's just the degree to which we do it and whether we're vocal about it or, or, or not. But it's a really loaded and uh, wonderful question. Yeah, that's a fair and honest answer too, Steve. Like, you're, you're a real credit to this town. Um, the thing with human rights is it, it transcends a lot of the positive law and a lot of the regulations and rules that you might choose for yourself in your own personal life or in your church. And then it comes in conflict. And what Steve says is true. Most human rights commissions and organizations that are true to their creed, they give everybody an equal assignment of dignity, worth, and respect. So you can't say that, well, my freedom of religion, so to speak, doesn't permit what you're doing. And I think you shouldn't be able to do it because you're infringing on myself. You can do that in a local community that agrees to a certain set of principles, but in a human rights commission in a town, you can't do that. You, you have to accord that equality and dignity to everybody. So that's really where human rights steps outside of any particular institution or any body of positive law. And then if you find a law that's in conflict with that principle, that law is probably not gonna stay on the books very long. Uh, Same-sex marriage is a perfect example in Massachusetts. So that's a great question and, and something that you will all struggle with. And what Steve says is true. We are all biased, myself included. And that the humility of recognizing that goes a long way to respecting other people. None of us are perfect and even close to it. It's a journey. And I was telling Joe earlier, it's a marathon. So be patient. You're going to be doing this for years to come. It's not a sprint. Well, I, I also think it's important to acknowledge, and um, it was, you know, I, I will say I had a, a bit of reservation coming into this, just wondering, are we all going to be in support of all human rights? Because I think some of us, you know, have expressed ourselves, um, rather it be in social media or just through the town and it's a small town and and, you know, I think word gets out about people's views and, and sometimes it's not always accurate, but in general, the way that I'm looking at this is we're coming together, we're, we're putting this commission together to support everybody because we believe in human rights generally. And, and I do think we don't want to, we don't want there to be any hypocrisy here. So I, I think it's important that we're all transparent and that we as a commission and a, a committee of people are going to be learning from each other too you know and, and I, I i my hope is that we can open the eyes of everybody that is on the commission to start and then we're going to reach out to the community and hopefully provide that support and develop programs where everybody's learning but that includes all of us it, it includes all of us as well 
So I understand the question. I think it's a little, I, I think what they're asking is more um, directly related to who we are as we stand together to, to form this committee and support people in the community. And they wanna know, is, is this genuine? And again, we have people here that are supporting the, the different aspects of human rights. Um, so it's important that we educate each other amongst ourselves as well and just be open about that. Well said, Mandy. And, it, and it, oh. if I can just add, add a little bit to the conversation here, I think that um, with our forum tonight is, is kind of our introduction to the first step of this long process, like you said, Joe, you know, it's, it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, you know, and it's going to take some time for us to figure out kind of our bearings with our committee and get our charge together, our point, our members, you know, tonight, all the panelists were just asked to share their stories, you know, and then the next step is for the board of selectmen to meet and review all the applications and then seat the panel or seat the committee. And so, you know, those of you that are attending tonight as a panelist or as an attendee, or if you want to talk to your neighbor because they like to, you know, be included in, and have a strong interest in human rights, encourage them to apply uh, for a seat on the, on, the, on the committee. You know, we want, we want a, good, a good base of people with some, some really good passion for this cause and for inclusivity for all of our citizens. And, you know, kind of when when we have a good committee, uh, I think everyone's going to win because over the summer when, when Joe and, and Russ and I were speaking about it, you know, we saw it as a, a positive thing. It wasn't kind of looking at what's wrong with our community. It was a, what we can do to build a better community. And that's what we're looking to do. You know, we all have biases and issues, you know, amongst ourselves, but sitting down and having that discussion and, 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 bridging that gap and, and getting communication. You know, the, the more you know somebody on a personal level, the, the more you're going to appreciate their point of view and, and see their side of the story. You know, as long as we can have that dialogue, you know, and that's what we're looking to do is start that dialogue with this committee and, and work to better our community. You know, if I might say something here, uh, back to the elderly um, and thank you, Sean. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, years ago, shutting down all the institutions here in Massachusetts, uh, and they've put the um, mentally challenged people in with the elderly people. And that's, um, that can cause some concern. Um, I never really gave it much thought until my husband and I moved here to elderly housing and um, got to know uh, some of the residents at Brooks House and, and the challenges that they have. And they are just the sweetest, nicest people. And I've met their families and uh, um, Joanne Copeland and I are co-chair of the Tenants Association here. Um, and we've finally gotten people to come out of their apartments. We had a big cookout a few years ago before the pandemic. And we had over 30 residents come. We have 40 residents that live here. So that was pretty pretty good to have that many people come. But um, that's a challenge. Um, me mental illness is something that people don't understand either. And, and it, it's tough when when you know people are having a problem and, and uh, living in the same little, uh, little area here, you know. But um, I'm sorry to hear that Mandy uh, had a problem at school and her children, because my, all my kids graduated from the regional and um, now my great grandchildren are going here. So um, it's sad when you hear about that because I grew up here in Hamilton. And uh, we had 22 in our graduating class. And we went to the old Hamilton High School where the library is now. As a matter of fact, I have some of the bricks from the building when they took it down. But um, it's sad when you hear things like that because our generation, we, of course we didn't have the social media either. You know, We didn't have Facebook, we didn't have 
um, the texting and all that business. As you saw, I had a problem <laughs> tonight just trying to get on. But it, um, uh, I'm finding even that uh, I just turned 80, I'm, I'm a little more tolerant than I used to be. Um, uh, but it's, I'm sorry to, and I'm Frank too, I'm sorry to hear uh, that this Frank has had problems with his kids doing play dates. That amazes me. I thought this was a, a community that um, uh, they wanted to be united. And, and I, I think Hamilton is mostly a democratic community, which it, which said they they for unity. I'm very surprised at that. That's all. That's I'm done. <laughs> okay, another one, Joe. Another yeah, we question? have a we have a resident that's raised her hand and asked to be identified. So I'm going to allow her to talk. Um, Allison Jenkins. Hi. How are you? I just want to say that I don't think it's that unusual um, that the town is less tolerant than it probably could be and should be. Um, I'm white, so I haven't found any issues, but I do that. You know that people that approach me, even a little family that um, their child broke their arm and I ended up driving the child to, to the um, children's hospital for the broken arm because she had lived here for over 10 years and had small children and in the school district, but didn't have anyone to call to take her in while her husband was out of town because she's of Indian descent and just hasn't been welcomed into this community at all. Uh, and Allison, no, no matter how advanced you get, you're gonna have that and, it, and it's gonna stay and it's gonna exist. Um, as much as Dedham has progressed and as, and as vibrant as a community is, we have a swath of the population that is very upset that things aren't what they used to be 10 years ago. Um, and they're very unhappy that the school committee has voted to hire a equity and inclusion coordinator. We have a Cuban African American woman who's wonderful. She's part of our human rights commission. The, the first day on the job, the hate mail started uh, calling her a racist and 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 saying we don't we shouldn't have this in our schools and a lot of it's the discomfort that you know we shouldn't feel i mean you know the 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 history of oppression is undeniable to native americans and people of color and if we're going to advance and grow we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable and a lot of people are not so whether it's an LGBTQ issue or, 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 or race, uh, people are not gonna be comfortable, but we make it so that these kids do speak up. You know, we have Chinese American students that have talked about the Immigration Exclusion Act, the first Immigration Act that specifically said this particular group is not welcome in America because they're dirty and they're inferior. And these children are very well aware of that act and they're very well aware of the things that Frank's talking about. And we make sure they have a place to speak and they do speak and it makes people uncomfortable. But if you get through that period of discomfort, then you get to a better place and you'll find that you're gonna really enjoy one another and you're gonna, and you're gonna bond in a way. You gotta be comfortable being uncomfortable. It's hurtful. Joe, so I got another resident, uh, Tracy yep. Hutchinson. Tracy? Tracy, go ahead. Looks like she's- Hold on, hold on, hold on. Got her. Hi, I'm, I'm, yeah. I am. I'm actually a resident of Wenham. And first of all, I want to applaud all of you and thank you so much for bringing all of these issues to the forefront. I think it's a huge part in our community where communication is key, period. Um, and I just want to speak to what you had said, Joe, again, about the fact of being uncomfortable. I think it's not just those of us that deal with differences in our families of feeling uncomfortable, but it's also challenging the rest of our community members to be okay feeling a little bit comfortable. My quick blip. So first of all, I also just wanted to commend 
Frank and Alice and raising wonderful children and being incredible role models for how to be successful and do the right thing despite feeling oppressed in a community is huge. And Mandy, you I have seen firsthand in so many ways, both advocate for your children and mine as well. So I wanna say thank you to both of you. And obviously, Jamie, it goes without saying, you know, my heart is there with you and all of you. So I just wanted to give a quick, uh, my son Ben is very significant um, special needs, medical needs. He went through a, he has a seizure disorder and at different times in his life, I have put things out to his classmates and parents and things like that to just explain, hey, if your child comes home and asks a question, here's what's going on. And at one point when he was in middle school, it was very clear that I was not to send that out to any parent or anyone else because that could make someone else feel uncomfortable with my sharing personal information. So I do think that there's a place, as you said, Joe, for all of us to sit with our own discomfort, but also challenge our community that it's okay to feel uncomfortable sometimes and it's okay to ask questions sometimes. And if we're going to be open and discuss things, then we need to be open and honest in doing that. And as you all have brought up, also being accepting of all people. All people are special. Beautiful, Tracy. Thank you so much. Can I make a, a point about that? Um, you know, we're talking about being uncomfortable. One of the things that uh, was brought to Natalie's attention, there are many spaces that are called safe spaces, and we all know what that means. There's a new model out there called a brave space. And if you were to go out and look up Google safe space versus brave space, you'll find that the basic tenet of it is you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable with topics. It's a, it's a really brilliant study that's been done and a model that's been created um, where you don't say, let's agree to disagree. You say, let's talk about this. Let me understand you. You can understand me, but you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So I advise you to go out and look at that Brave Space model. Um, it would be a great um, uh, model for, this, for the, the town to undertake as well. Thanks, thanks, Steve. Okay, Darcy, you've been smiling, affirming all the speakers. So, Way um, to the back and forth. We gotta hear from you now. All right, I, I have a theory that over time, as people get to know one another, they will intermarry and we will have lots of babies <laughs> that are of every kind of creed that you can imagine. And I just think that's going to be the end point. I think it's going to come probably faster than we uh, even realize. I, I just think um, that's where our hopes will, will be for the future. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> and I can't wait. I think it's going to be great. <laughs> Okay, well, we still have another 10 minutes, uh, at least as the plan portion of the program. I have to say though, you guys, it's not even your first day and you're already doing it. <laughs> you guys are, you got, I got an optimistic hope for your town. You guys are really great. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say, I'm really enjoying the, the personal stories and Tracy's story. Um, one of my lives, I'm, I'm a nurse and um, I, I just cannot imagine why it would be frowned upon to send information about a child's illness so that um, people could understand because kids ask questions. And I, I think if you can tell your child about another child's story and you can tell it in a humane and compassionate way, I, 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 I can't say any other reason i mean i i cannot see any reason to not allow that and obviously as you were saying joe b that maybe it's um the the uh administration's discomfort with that but boy that's something we definitely um need to talk about as well because i'm i'm all for talking about things i so value people's opinions and their and their thoughts about things and the more i can understand people i just feel like my heart is opening and and really valuing the opportunity that that people are giving me to to listen to their stories so thank you all you know, one other thing I'd like, like to say on that is that we are starting the kids off early in Dedham. Uh, 
those who are against what you guys are doing, they think that you should keep this away from the kids. It's too much for them. It's overwhelming. They can't mm -hmm. handle it. And we, we disagree. The kids are so, so smart. They know. So the children starting off in the K ages, they're reading the book, So You Want to Talk About Race. Their families are, and there's, we're starting to have the families get to know each other right from K-1 so that they, when they go to the football fields together and the soccer fields, yeah. they already have a basis to start at ground one. So anyway, uh, someone else had a hand, Jamie? Yeah, so I could have tons to say, um, but I was actually just chiming in. And so, you know, if there's time at the end and people wanna hear me talk, that's fine. But um, there's been, I think we've said it in the chat and maybe some other places, but just so everybody knows, the commission is not, uh, the commission's been approved on paper. It's not actually formed. You can apply, um, and we will want to get it going. Yeah. <laughs> Just a bunch of people. A bunch of people have asked. So we, we've yeah, got a couple of nice. other attendees that have asked to be recognized. Uh, uh, a young Hoon Yoon. I've uh, yes. activated you, Young Hoon. If I, I hope I'm I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, yeah. No, you're you're. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I just go by Yong. Um, hi, thanks for the space. I'm really excited for the work that you all are doing and stories that you're sharing. Um, I just wanted to um, comment just to kind of, I guess, uh, focus on one part. Like, we keep talking about, uh, I, I've been hearing, like, yes, like we have these like stories around racism in Hamilton, in one of them. And we also have, and someone else had mentioned, like, yes, like, we also have to acknowledge like other aspects of uh, inequality and um, um, unequitable situations within. So I, I think that's like such a like important thing to mention is to like that intersectionality of different identities, different abilities, different privileges. Um, but we also have to understand that like um, racism in our country, in this town, have a very specific history, very, very specific set of um, events and dynamics that we have to like, acknowledge in order to combat that. And <laughs> having said that, I also um, found the, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know who said this, but like, um, found the comment about like intermarrying interesting because yes, like that's interesting way to think about like race and how people think about race. Um, but if we do not teach our children, if we do not teach ourselves, if we do not openly talk about how to empathize and do our research and seek different perspectives, um, there's gonna be another thing, right? Even if racism will be gone, even if racism is gone in like, you know, 2000 years, like there'll be something else popping up that will create inequality, um, that will uh, endanger human. So I just wanted to kind of, I wanted to make sure like that also said. Um, a couple of folks have asked about uh, the applications and where they should go to and what the deadline is. Uh, the applications are uh, on the website if you haven't got one. Uh, Jamie also shared them in the chats. Uh, you please submit them to the town manager's office, then we'll uh, get them to the board of selectmen. Um, the board will be, they've been waiting to appoint this committee commission for some time now. Uh, they wanted to have this evening's meeting first. So um, at an upcoming meeting somewhat soon. So. There's not a deadline per se, but there are five uh, at-large spots from, for residents of the town. Um, and the goal is to try to represent various uh, uh, different uh, groups within the community as much as possible. So if, if folks could, um, folks on the, on the call tonight who haven't already applied, if you could apply uh, to give the uh, Board of Selectmen as much to chew on as possible, that would be helpful. And uh, we'll try to get them uh, all those. You could have them to us by um, uh, the middle of next week, Tuesday or Wednesday, that would be great. Uh, th this may be on the subject. Uh, this may be a subject on their agenda on the fifteenth. So that agenda hasn't been set yet by the chairman. But uh, just in case, if you could have them to us by early next week, that would be helpful. Um, I think Tracy wanted to be uh, recognized one more time as well. If that's if people feel that we have time, Tracy. Tracy, you're you're muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. I was just wondering if it would be possible, if this is one of those committees I feel strongly would be great to have 
as a joint community committee. So Hamilton went them together because we do function so much together as human beings and in our two towns. And I think it's almost a shame to have two separate committees for these two little tiny towns when we're really yeah. function, especially with children in school as one. May I take that? <laughs> okay. um, yeah, Tracy, thanks for the suggestion. We, we It was discussed early on, um, as, as Sean related, he and I and the chief were talking about it. Um, there was a, a, a Facebook group that brought together um, um, that was talking about it in both towns. And then um, there was also folks in one of them that were talking about it. Part of the reason we decided not to is that even though we do share the school district and library and a few other things, and even though there are a lot of similarities between the two towns, the towns do have very different governmental structures. Um, so the way that you would re you know resolve things that come up in one town or the other um, mm -hmm. would be different. So one of the things that we thought was that each town would have its own commission, uh, the uh, volunteer um, ad hoc a coalition that is the Hamilton Wenham Human Rights Coalition that is different. It's not an official government entity, but it, it is out there. Uh, each commission would would be able to uh, you know, cooperate and collaborate with the others, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll definitely be looking for um, some uh, defined relationship with the school department as well. So uh, I understand the thought. We did we just we did discuss it, but in, in the end, the the governmental structures of the two towns just made it cleaner and easier to have two separate commissions. Thank you. This is, I don't know if there's any, um, you know what, but I'm still seeing a hand here by Young. Young, I'll, uh, Young did you want to speak again? I, I still see the hand raised in your um, spell list. Maybe not. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Okay. okay. Um, so. Okay. Well, I think you guys have done your your work tonight, and uh, I've I've asked the the group before. Where's the best place to eat in Hamilton? So if I come visit you all, <laughs> I still don't. <laughs> Rosie said her house, but <laughs> Joe says a pub. But yeah, I'll, I'll take it away. I'll take it away when you come. Dinner's on me. Okay. Well, listen, there's been one good thing about this <laughs> pandemic. I have learned how to cook. So anytime you'd like to come, please do. Okay. I'll bring my wife and kids. You guys are wonderful. You bet. It's been, it's been great. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate all the input tonight. Um, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Good night. Good, good night. night. Thank you. Oh, for, uh, those, for those who haven't checked out yet, um, the next step will be for the Board of Selectmen to, uh, there was a quick uh, last question, what's the next step? The next step will be for the Board of Selectmen to appoint the commission members, and then for that commission to organize itself. So um, we'll keep you in, involved by notifying you via the town website. And we have a bi-weekly e-newsletter now through the town website. So sign up for that. I'm sure we'll share news about the Human Rights Commission in the, in the newsletter. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.